Sean Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us for Newsmaker Saturday. Governor Katie Hobbs sent shockwaves across the country, certainly here in Arizona last week, when she sounded the alarm on Arizona's water future. Take a listen. If we do nothing, we could face a 4% shortfall in groundwater supplies over the next 100 years. We have to close this gap and find efficiencies for our water use, manage our aquifers wisely, and increase our utilization of renewable supplies. Well, this was read by the media in some very interesting ways. The Business Insider and other publications sounded the alarm that Arizona's days of rapid growth might be over. Another headline read, no water, no subdivisions. Here were the takeaways. Arizona will halt approvals of new developments that don't plan for full water resources. And a new rule applies to the Phoenix area, of course, with a population that just topped 5 million in 2022. The state is also under federal pressure to use less water from the Colorado River. Joining me now to talk about the implications, a guy who's right in the middle of it with one of the fastest growing cities, small cities in America. Paul Gardner is the Water Resources Director for the city of Queen Creek. You've got a beautiful city. Thank you, Paul, for joining us. Thank you, John, for having me today. Paul, how did you read what the governor said last week? Because some people, um, I would call them heavy hitters in this community, expressed to me that it may have been too hyperbolic and that you could give ammunition to cities that want to, or uh, uh, companies that want to move here to Arizona. States like Texas, Utah, Colorado, Florida could say, hey, you don't want to go to Arizona. They've got this water problem, and this just exacerbates that whole image. What did you think? Well, I think there's a couple things that makes us very unique as both a state and as a, a valley, and that is we're the only place in the entire country that before you buy a home that you get a certificate of assured water supply for 100 years. The second thing I would say is we agree with the governor's assessment and ADWR that the future of mining groundwater for long-term development is over. But that doesn't mean that we're out of water supplies. And I think that what we need to get across as a state is that we still have plenty of water. It's just how it's used and how it's appropriated. Um, Agricultural still is our largest user of water. Uh, at least 70% of all the water used in the state is agriculturally used. Um, and the municipal cities throughout the valley and throughout the state are doing a very good job of diversifying their portfolios to uh, other water supplies. And, and in Queen Creek, you know, we've moved from being 90% reliant upon groundwater to in a given year, depending on where our water allocations, we may be anywhere from 30 to 50% uh, on renewable supplies. And our goal is in the next decade to be down to only five to 10% mining groundwater. Wow, so we, we that's think, a big we change. We think we're in a very unique position moving forward in that, you know, that, that study that was shown was over a hundred years uh, uh, of, of being a 4% deficit. Yeah, and, and a lot can change in 100 years. We're going to get, I, I suspect, much better at reusing everything we've got. In other words, if you flush a toilet, we're gonna, I, people will freak out, but we're going to end up drinking that. And, and in a sense, we do now. They certainly do it on the space station. We know how to do this stuff, um, and I suspect we're going to get a lot better at it. Yeah, yes, and when we look at a, a, a body of water that we may go out and acquire, for example, we worked about five years of bringing in uh, 2,000 acre feet off the Colorado River from a small community called Cibola. That water will enter into Queen Creek this, this summer. Um, over 100 years, that small little 2,000 acre feet becomes 200,000 acre feet of, of water that we would have pumped if we didn't have it. But because we get to use that water again and again and again, that 2,000 acre feet grows to 365,000 acre feet over 100 years. Oh my goodness. So yeah. every little drop counts because in Arizona, we re use water three, four, five, six, seven times. Yeah, Paul, we're actually, you know, people don't talk about it. We are actually very good at this in Arizona. And one of the stats that absolutely blows my mind, I'm gonna run it by you, 
Arizona uses less water than we did in 1957. We had a million people then, we've got 7.5 million now. That is remarkable. And in that time frame, obviously, since 1957, we brought CAP online. So when everybody talks about a water crisis, if you really start to dig down a little bit, you say, well, wait a minute, if that's the number, we're using less water than in 1957, how does that constitute a crisis? Well, I, I would go into, for example, for our community, when we, uh, we're still agriculturally based to a certain extent. And when we remove uh, an acre of farmland and convert it into housing, we go from a consumptive use of five acre feet per acre for growing cotton and alfalfa to one acre foot per acre for growing three homes. And with those three homes, we get a return flow of about 50%. So our net loss is about a half acre foot per acre now. So it's almost like a 90% savings when we do the conversion. And that's how Arizona has organically grown from a million people to 7 million and overall reduce the water demand across the entire yep. state. How do you do this? And you've got this with Queen Creek because you still have ag in Queen Creek, right? Correct, yes. Okay, so how do you guys work on this issue? Knowing that ag uses 74% of all of our water, how do you work with them without demonizing them? So w what we look at it is, is that they're a placeholder and that over time, the last crop they're gonna grow is homes. And so we work very good <laughs> with the agriculture community because what we've worked with them and other municipalities throughout the Valley have is that th they, ha they are now using, for the most part, renewable supplies that the cities have developed and aren't quite using yet because they haven't grown into it. And so groundwater they would have pumped is now saved because they're using renewable supplies. Got so it. we now look at them in the valley as a partner Yep. because yep. they're taking our excess water. I, I, I don't have the ability right now to take treated water and do the next step to filter it to deliver it to our customers, but I can put it into a canal system and they can use that water versus pumping groundwater. And it's as if I put it back in the aquifer. Yep. Those are great partnerships to have. Okay, we talked about the governor and what she said earlier about the water, the 4% water shortage projected over the 100 years on groundwater. This uh, next soundbite from the governor is what really got everybody's attention. Take a listen. As required by law, we will pause approvals of new assured water supply determinations that rely on pumping groundwater, ensuring that we don't add to any future deficit. This pause will not affect growth within any of our major cities where robust water portfolios have been proven to cover current and future demands. I cannot emphasize that enough. This pause will not affect industrial development or construction of more of the more than 80,000 lots outside of our designated cities for which certificates have already been issued. So, Paul, what did that mean to you in a place like Queen Creek where you do use a lot of groundwater? So what it meant to us was it was a clear signal that moving forward, that mining the groundwater is over in that any new development that does not have a certificate of assured water supply, we will have to bring renewable supplies directly to them for them to move forward. But to emphasize for Queen Creek, 90, 92% of our entire community, both existing residential and about 15,000 platted lots, have a certificate of assured water supply. We are down to the last 10,000 lots that we have to find a renewable supply and marry it with the landowners. And so we're on board to do that. Um, the other thing that I think we need to uh, keep in mind is Queen Creek landed the, the largest battery uh, plant in North America with LG that is breaking ground. And you know they're bringing $5.5 billion of their own money into town to build the largest uh, battery uh, facilities in the entire country, if not the world. Um, we will be providing water for them also, 
but the water we'll be providing them will be a renewable supply also for them. And so it's important to know that these are things we've been working on for a long time. So growth yeah. won't be stop, uh, stopping because again, we have 15,000 lots that are ready to go forward on. We are still either the number one or two fastest growing community in the state and sometimes the top five in the country. So we, we and, and we're not a cheap place to move to. I think that's the other thing. Sometimes we get painted that, you know, developers move out to the rural areas because land is cheap. Land is not cheap in Queen Creek. We are a move up, move up, move up community. When your starter homes are at 500 to 600,000, people are moving here for quality of life issues yeah. to bring their family for employment and for, for the lifestyle of, of enjoying the open spaces and the trail systems that we have. Yeah, you know, uh, you guys just got a new zip code, which tells you about the growth there. You've got the 85144, yes. you just got that this week. And yes, you we guys, did. since 1989, I think you've doubled your population to more than 66,000 residents and you're projected to get to 125,000. One more question about the governor's comments last week. A cynic might say that some of this is predicated on pushing people to higher density living. That in other words, there are some people who would love to see everybody moving into the city where they would take transportation, public transportation, ride their bike to work, walk to work, have everything right around them and not need a car. That doesn't work in Queen Creek. Um, that is that is correct. So we think that in the valley there is plenty of choices for where people want to live. Um, uh, we have heard the same things of whether you know this is a social engineering project where you can go vertical inside the the, the top cities. So we feel like for Queen Creek we have a lifestyle that we present or that we represent in that people are moving out here because they want to enjoy this type of lifestyle. They love the schools that we have. They love the government that we have. They love the open spaces. They love the, the trail systems. They love the quality of life. And so we think we're gonna do just fine. That's great. Paul, uh, we appreciate it. Paul Gardner, Water Resources Director for the City of Queen Creek. Continued success. I know that's gonna mean more people in your city, but it depends on how you measure success. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, John. Good to see you. Coming up next on Newsmaker Saturday, a move that rocked the golf and sports world this week. Did the PGA just make a pact with the devil? The Saudi-backed Live Tour you've been hearing about. We're going to talk to a sports writer about that when Newsmaker Saturday returns. Welcome back to Newsmaker Saturday. A tidal wave just washed over the world of professional golf. This week, the PGA Tour announced it would merge with Live Golf, the Saudi-backed men's golf organization that formed last year to compete with the PGA. News of the merger sent shockwaves through the sports world and even the political world because of the complicated relationship between the U.S. and the Saudi government, mainly because 15 of the 19 9-11 hijackers hailed from Saudi Arabia. It's complicated. And now the PGA finds itself in a partnership with a group that it once condemned. Matt Napolitano is a sports anchor with Fox News Radio and host of Fox in the Fast Lane. Matt, great to see you. Thanks for having me. Matt, what do you make of what happened in the last week? We thought that these two were so at war that there would be no middle ground, but I guess in the end, money talks. I'll be honest, a lot of us were in that same boat. We really were not expecting this merger to come through. Even PGA golfers had met with Jay Monahan, the commissioner of the PGA Tour on Sunday with the player advisory committee, and there was no inkling that this was even on the radar. Some live golfers say there was some talk of it within their inner circle, but there was little known to it would come out as fast and furious as this did. It really is surprising when you think back to everything the PGA Tour has been saying about loyalty to the brand, loyalty to the sport of golf, lashing out over the Saudi financiers of the Live Golf League, as you mentioned there in the introduction. And now to sit here knowing that by next year, we're having this golf entity that encompasses both the PGA Tour and Live, as well as bringing in the DP World Tour, it's still quite the surprise. But yeah, money is at the root of it. 
Matt, uh, there is some talk. Barstool Sports broke it, I believe, that John Rahm, world number one, major winner, that and he had been very quiet about Liv. When he was asked about it, he never really blasted them. That he may have been the catalyst because he may have been ready to defect. Is that true? There have been rumors that Rahm may have been the final straw, but one thing that also needs to be examined is the fact that the Live Golf League itself, in terms of ratings and the fan base that it was drawing in, it didn't have quite the pull that we see from the PGA Tour, especially when it comes to major tournaments. Let's face it, when the Masters rolls around the U.S. Open, the PGA Championship, golf fans are locked in for those four days. The fact of the matter is there's going to be a lot of explaining to do for these PGA golfers that stayed loyal amidst the other side getting tremendous paydays, sometimes to the tune of nine figures for the bonuses. Oh and now you yeah. see, when you look at the overall winnings and compare PGA Tour to Live, it's just an extraordinary amount of a difference. It's going to really bring up a lot of ill will, if you will. Uh, towards some of these golfers in regards to how they've been experiencing the game of golf over the past two years. Yeah, and I think you can't find a better illustration of that than Rory McIlroy. He was absolutely loyal to the PGA Tour, likely yeah. turned down a lot of money because he's one of the top players in the world. He's a multiple major winner. Um, let's play a little sound from Rory because I think Rory, with good reason, feels like he got shafted. He was loyal. He didn't take the money. And now this. Listen to Rory. When I try to remove myself from the situation and I look at the bigger picture and I look at 10 years down the line, you know, I think ultimately this is going to be, um, it's going to be good for the, the, the game of professional golf. I think it secures the, uh, it unifies it and it and it secures its its financial future. So, um, you know, there's there's mixed emotions in there as well. All I've wanted to do and all I've wanted, you know, in the past year from basically this tournament is to protect the future of the PGA Tour and and protect the aspirational nature of of what the PGA Tour stands for. Um, and I hope that this does that, whether you like it or not the PIF, we're going to keep spending money in golf. At least the PGA Tour now controls how that money is spent. You know, so I'd, you know, if you're thinking about, some, you know, one of the biggest sovereign wealth funds in the world, would you rather have them as a partner or, the, or an enemy? Um, at the end of the day, money talks, and you'd rather have them as a partner. There still has to be consequences to actions. You know, the people that left the PGA Tour irreparably harmed this tour, started litigation against it. Like, we can't just welcome them back in. Like, that's not going to happen. And I think that was the one thing that Jay was trying to get across yesterday. Is like, guys, we're not just going to bring these guys back in and pretend like nothing's happened. I still hate live. Like, I hate live. Like, I, I hope it goes away. And I would fully expect that it does. Matt, th that strong words. You can see the anger. He's pretty diplomatic about it in the long view. But he has to absolutely feel like he was propping up the PGA scenery and they pulled the rug out from under him. Yeah, that's absolutely the feeling for Rory McIlroy. I mean, this guy has been a loyalist from the get-go when it comes to this whole debate over the PGA Tour and Liv. You know, he referenced a meeting that took place at the RBC Canadian Open uh, this weekend, coming into this weekend, uh, in which PGA golfers finally got to sit down with Jay Monahan, the commissioner, and really learn what this deal is all about. Uh, during that meeting, we have learned that there was calls for Monaghan to resign from leadership because of the approach that was taken and the lack of transparency regarding this merger that's forthcoming. The split we heard was basically 90 to 10 in terms of the people that are right now against the commissioner. So his days very well could be waning. And for guys like Rory McIlroy that say, yeah, you know, money talks. They could get the last laugh here because Jay Monahan may have made this deal come to fruition, but he may not even live to see the entity come to any kind of fruition, any kind of success for the long run. Now, when you mention the Saudi public investment fund, uh, investment fund the PIF there, that was mentioned by Rory McIlroy, that has been the primary financier of the Live Golf League. The governor of that fund is going to be on the board of directors for this new entity, which has left a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths, especially when it comes to the human rights record of Saudi Arabia 
and the so-called sports washing is what they refer to it as to kind of distract from what's been going on within that country. We saw 9-11 Families United actually issue a statement against Jay Monahan, who they propped up after he was the first to turn around amidst the toil between the PGA Tour and the Live Golf League and turn around and told them that we will never forget and that this is shockingly offensive to those that we lost and those families that continue to hurt to this day. No doubt. I mean, you're from the East Coast. You 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 were around yeah. during during 9-11. I presume you were a young man, but nonetheless, uh, 15 of the 19 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. Then the Washington Post reporter, um, Jamal Khashoggi, he was assassinated at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in 2018 at the behest of the crown prince. He ordered the hit. I mean, this is heavy stuff to have them as a partner. Exactly. And it's hard for a lot of fans to turn a blind eye. And I think that's why even golf fans stood so loyal with the PGA Tour, because the fact is we know what Saudi Arabia has done. We know what's gone on with their human rights record. We know their approach towards women. We know their approach towards the LGBTQ plus community. We know their approach in regards to the histories of you brought up the hijackers on 9-11, 2001. It hits home for a lot of people, and that's why, especially after Jay Monahan was so resolute in calling this out in the formation and the eventual coming to fruition of the Live Golf League, it really is the, quite the stunner and quite the gut punch for a lot of folks. Yeah, let's let's uh, put up a graphic of Jay Monahan. This was um, we can't show the clip because it was on CBS. But he was asked and he was basically saying, you know, the PGA has a high road and said, have you ever had to apologize for being a member of the PGA Tour? That was pretty strong stuff. He was kind of saying, look, we're here. We're not going anywhere. We're going to fight this. And this is the League of Integrity. This is the group of, the, of golfers with integrity. That's kind of out the window now. We're going to have to kind of make peace. And I guess for the fan, you know, the, the NFL merged with the AFL, and life went on. Um, we had a World Series. I, I, I think it started in 1903, and that was a merging of leagues as well to some degree. The NHL took over the, the World Hockey Association, the NBA and the ABA in 1976. You think that these things are irreconcilable, but in the end, sometimes they can make it work. And I suspect golf fans, if they're interested in the tournament, in a major, as you mentioned, they'll watch anyway. That's just it. Golf fans are going to be tuning in, and it could be exciting in terms of what it holds for the future of the sport on the global stage. That being said, I have to take back from the statement that was made by 9-11 Families United, and that is, we will never forget. And I think that that is still going to be in the back of a lot of fans' heads. I mean, after all, when you look at other sports mergers, yeah, there was some tension, there was some animosity, but nothing near to the grand scale where it brings up international politics. What about having a partner that's an international, to some degree, pariah, having them as your partner in business? How does that work? How does that play? Well, that's what's going to be interesting going forward. You know, Jay Monahan, when he spoke to the press on Tuesday, seemed to allude that the PGA Tour is the one in the driver's seat here, that they're going to be in charge of the direction of this new golf entity, that they're going to be overseeing what happens to the format of the game. They did acknowledge that the group format from Live Golf League is going to be a part of the future ga oh, wow. of gameplay. But beyond that, it seems as though the Saudi Public Investment Fund is basically for lack of a better term, a silent partner in this operation, that they're basically going to throw the money at this thing to make golf the global game that it can be and this new entity, but they're not going to really have a say in the matter. Now, that drew a comment to, on a Thursday from Live Golf head Greg Norman, the former champ himself on the links, basically alluding that Live will go on in some capacity, maybe not what it's gotten to in these past two years, but it's still going to linger which has to have Monaghan and a lot of folks on the PGA Tour side of things yeah. wondering, well, then what exactly are we getting ourselves into yeah, if right. we're not taking out this rival? Okay. Hey, listen, I sure appreciate it. Matt Napolitano, sports anchor with Fox News Radio. Great to see you, Matt. Enjoy your summer. Uh, we'll try to still enjoy golf. I'm sure we will, despite all of this craziness. Thank you, Matt Napolitano. I hope so. Thanks again. We are back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday. Welcome back on Newsmaker Saturday. While well, we find out that water and golf do mix, not on the golf course, it's a hazard, but it mixed on this show. 
We appreciate you watching. We'll see you next week on Newsmaker Saturday.